welcome geographers to this five minute geography lesson. We're covering theme five, which is weather, climate and ecosystems, element one, an introduction to climate change. So take your seat, get your planners out on the desk. I'm Mr. S and I'll be your five minute teacher. You'll have heard a whole lot about climate change in the news and in the media. Uh, it's a hot topic with students even campaigning out on the streets about it. But what's actually happening? Well, climate change is a significant change in the global temperature. It can be an increase in temperature, which would be called global warming, but it can also be a decrease, which is global cooling. But something that's not as well known as the fact that our changing global climate can also affect our weather patterns. So for example, the amount of precipita uh, precipitation that we get, which is rain and snow, for example. So let's get right into this. So on this screen that you can see now, we've got the Keeling curve. This shows the amount of CO2 that's been in the atmosphere since 1958. As you can see, there's a positive trend. It's moving up as we go through 1960 up to 2000. So it's gone from around 115 parts per million up to just over 370 parts per million at the end of the uh, 90s. But there is another pattern that we can see. So every year we get a fluctuation. So we've got a peak and we've got a trough. Now the peaks correspond to the Northern Hemisphere's winter, because that's where most of our land mass is in the Northern Hemisphere. During that time, vegetation is actually in a rather dormant state. It's not really been very active. So it's not producing uh, the photosynthesis to create, car uh, to create oxygen. It's leaving the carbon in the atmosphere. So we're gonna have more carbon there. Whereas in the summer, when vegetation is more active, what we're actually getting is more carbon taken out of the atmosphere to produce oxygen. So this rotation, this fluctuation is happening every single year. But overall, there is a positive trend with increase in the amount of carbon. But why are we talking about carbon? When usually, when we're talking about climate change, we're talking about a change in temperature. Well, if you have a look at these two graphs, the top one in the orange line is CO2, just like the Keeling curve, but it's over a much greater time period, over 400,000 years now. And underneath the blue one is the temperature over time, over that same time period. So you can see that actually match up quite nicely. If you look at D, that is the peak, which corresponds nicely with the peak in temperature at B. At C, we've got a trough, and we've also got a trough in temperature. So what we're looking at here is the fact that carbon and temperature look like they're directly linked. So the increase in carbon leads to an increase in temperature. These peaks and troughs do have names. So D, our peak, is called an interglacial period. That's the warmer points in our uh, time scale where the ice is melted and basically we're in one now, if you look at where A is. The Cs are the glacial periods. They're much colder and it means that polar ice is spread further south to cover what effectively would have been where we're living now. So there is a correlation between the two. But one last thing I'd like us to actually consider. If you look, CO2 doesn't rise above 300 uh, parts per million in the last 400,000 years. But we know from the Keeling graph that it starts at over 300 and finishes above 370. So in the last 60 years, we've seen more carbon in the atmosphere than we've seen over the last 400,000. But how do we know that's how much carbon was in the atmosphere 400,000 years ago? Well, we have a few different ways of collecting this evidence. The main one is these ice scores. So ice cores are effectively a bored hole into ice in the Antarctic, usually around Lake Vlastok, which is an under, uh, underground or under ice lake. And the ice traps the atmosphere at that point in time when the snow falls. So 400,000 years ago, snow would have fallen, trapping little pockets of air, and you can see them in the ice here. And you can also just about see the layers that make this up as well. So when scientists cut up the ice cores, they can test for the oxygen and the carbon that was present in the pocket of air at that point when it was frozen. You might also find pollen in there as well, which would tell you the type of plants that were living at that point in time. So do they require more heat? Were they more humid? Things like that. We can use dendrochronology, which is basically the study of tree rings. The thicker rings that you can see here that I'm highlighting are areas where we've got extended growth. So we've had better conditions such as more sunlight and more heat, maybe a bit more rain, which allowed the tree to grow faster. And so that growing period was longer. Whereas where we've got the thinner rings, there might not have been as much sunlight or as much heat. 
or they might not have just the right conditions and that means that actually it hasn't grown as much as it has in these thicker rings. We can use ancient evidence. So fossils of plants and animals tell us what type of plants and animals were living at that area at that point in time. So as I was mentioning, we might have a type of tree or a type of plant that likes really hot climates, but now it's actually in somewhere that's quite temperate. So it doesn't match up. So the climate in the past must have been different. And then finally, we know that some areas like the Lake District in the UK were formed by glaciers in part, but there's no glaciers there now. So in the past, we must have had a climate that would accommodate a lot of ice. Well, that about wraps up our five minute lesson. So hopefully climate change won't be getting you hot under the collar from now on. Don't forget to do the try it now tasks for homework. Class dismissed.